Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. You can respond. It's all right. Yeah, there you go. That's a good start. <laughs> Outstanding. Uh, my name is Ed Wank. I am with Cedia. I'm the content director with Cedia. And we have a slight change in the, uh, in the schedule today. The uh, title of this is actually going to be Building the Best instead of a specific theater. We're going to be having a general discussion on constructing award-winning home cinemas. We're talking reference quality cinemas in people's homes. And we're joined by Theo Calamarakis. Did I pronounce it correctly? Perfectly. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Got it right out of the gate. He is the executive director with uh, Reva. Explain to us what Reva is, quickly, for those who don't know. Reva is a, an, a, an attempt to kind of productize what has been so far a process or a project. Okay. We do custom theaters, we all do, uh, that take forever to build. And for the designer, it requires an enormous amount of attention, detail, hand-holding of the client. Right. So Reva is, a, a, is an attempt to take the elements of custom, custom home theater design and create modules out of it. So you plug them together, like uh -huh. you see the LEDs around the floor, and you have something that can work in the matter of uh, hours instead of a matter of months or years. But there is a lot of engineering and a lot of thought that goes before right. you get to that point. So that's whatever. My regular company, TK Theaters, we do custom design theaters one at a time based on the client's request. Uh, so this is the difference between the two. One is custom, the other is a product. Gotcha. It's the first time we do a design becomes a product. Gotcha. And Peter Miller's with us. He's an integrator, home right. technology professional. His firm is Cornflake. Mm -hmm. And where are you located? And tell us a little bit about the firm, if you don't mind. So we're li located central London. Okay. Always have been since 1986. Um, and we are an integrator that operate in, in the high end, not just for cinemas, but All right. whole integrated homes. Okay, and you've won how many awards now from CDO? Six, I believe you uh, said? Six. And the most recent one was for a dedicated home cinema, It was, right? yeah. All right. Now, tell us how you go through that discovery process with the client. How do you arrive at this notion of, no, I don't want a media room. I want a dedicated home cinema that's going to yeah. give me the best possible experience. Uh, well, I think it comes from their sort of brief and you get an understanding of how far the client is, is willing to go in that pursuit of having a home theatre. Okay. And that's quite evident from the first meeting. Um, taking up a lot of real estate in central London is, is a big thing and, and quite yes. costly. So they, the, the, the brief becomes quite clear very quickly from a client for, because of where we operate. So you often have to excavate, is that correct? I mean, we're talking about some major underground yes. construction with some of these cinemas. Absolutely. All yeah. right. It's, it's a big undertaking for clients. And how do they react when you tell them you're going to be <laughs> um, <laughs> doing all that digging? I, I, think they've, uh, I think they've already made that conscious decision to, if they want a home theatre, they, they know what they're going, the pain they're going to have to go okay. through to create that. Um, from our point, uh, we just sort of we confirm what parameters are required to achieve the best. So when you have a client who's kind of on the fence, whether it's yeah. a, a multi-purpose media room and we're talking about you know, something that might have bar, et cetera, et cetera, yep. versus a dedicated home cinema that's going to be absolutely reference quality, mm -hmm. when you've got somebody on the bubble, is there a tipping factor that takes you in one direction or another when you're in that discovery process? Uh, our showroom. Okay, that, that is the fair tipping enough. Factor. All right. So we'll, we'll uh, bring them into our showroom, which we've got a reference cinema, built-in showroom in central London. All right. If they are on the fence or they're, they're really deciding it, it's the experience that will tip them over the edge. Okay, all right. Do you have good, better, and best solutions, or is that off the table, or is it more like that's a conversation you don't want to have? I, 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 we don't sort of segregate them into... Uh, sections like that. All right. We sort of gauge what the client is wanting to do, what level they're wanting to do, and then we find the solution. Everything's unique. So we, we very rarely get a dedicated space of, you know, of, of so much square meterage. Right. This is what you can do. Um, we're usually having to find the best solution for the space. Sure. It's usually a compromise just because of real estate is so expensive. Right, right. And you'll inevitably get a, a client who wants a 15-seat theater when there's yep. clearly only room for five, correct? That's right, yeah. So how do you have that conversation? How do you talk them out of that 
uh, we Nightmare. get the main contractor to have that discussion with us so he understands <laughs> the costs. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that's the best way to, uh, to get that over the line. And what kind of tools do you use to express the vision to the client? I mean, it's easy to sit there and talk about what's going to happen, but yep. to actually visually represent what's going to occur. So luckily, over the last 32 years since we've been, been trading, we've got lots of case studies, we've got lots of visuals. Um, we also uh, have a great CAD team who can uh, model and create 2D renders, 3D renders of the space. Um, so it's really a, a, a journey of exciting the client in, in different, and showing them different directions for what the room could look like. Gotcha. Now, how many folks do you employ? 32. All right, and who is responsible for what and how does that labor force break down into who's handling what on a, on a, on a build site? So um, we have um, the sales and design. Sure. Um, who will take the, the project from a, um, a, a written design and then it will hand over to the project team. The project team will then fulfill that project until the end, until the handover from both projects, the lead engineer and the sales guy at the end of the project. But you also have um, the uh, CAD team that give detailed information to the contractor uh -huh. to, to say that we want the, the walls built in this way, we want the seating this way, and we'll give elevations, angles uh, for, the, for the projection, screen sizes, speaker placement. It's all, um, it's all detailed to, minute detail to the, to the contractor. Gotcha. So it's, actu it, it's actually an easy task to hand over the information that we give. Gotcha, gotcha. I know we have some of your work um, in the slide deck there, so if the, if the fellas yeah, could yeah. like, could you, yeah, here we go. And this is an example of a cornflake home cinema, correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Tell us a little bit about the project, if you don't mind, and some so of the struggles that you undertook in creating this thing. So the, the, the project um, is uh, subterranean in a, in a basement. Okay. Um, so to create a room within a, within a room, um, it was quite an undertaking. Um, also, all the walls needed to be um, uh, lined and damp-proofed. Um, the system couldn't be in that same room, so we yep. had to cable um, through concrete and, and steel to get it to a, a, a different space. Right. Um, the client um, was quite, uh, quite strict with what he saw in the room, so he wanted the aesthetics of the room to be key, not speakers, not technology. Right. So we, we had to be clever with the way we hid the technology right. in the room, but uh, I think it hit one in one more, more of a sitting room environment, which I think that's, that's what we've achieved there. Absolutely. Uh, we'll get into some sound isolations in a little bit, but I wanted to talk to Theo too and talk about your client discovery and some of the same things that you undertake. Or? More or less, these are universal. In okay. our case, we don't have the difficulties that uh, these guys have in London where they have to dig the underground. Space. Right. Uh, we usually have the opportunity to put the theater in a house that is abundance of spaces. Right. So that is not the issue. The main question is finding out what the client wants. Usually the client come to us because they read about us, they saw my books, they know gotcha. my reputation, so they know what we do. We've been doing it for 25 years. We've been got about 11 awards at CIDIA, so it's been, uh, we've established as a theater designers, as opposed to someone that does is an architect or designer only. We just specialize in the design and we don't do electronics. Okay, the electronics, you're, you're straight up a designer. I, absolutely, we work with practically every integrator in the world okay. that hand in hand to, to create a synergy between the architecture, the design, and the technology. Well, you came at this from a pretty interesting, and keep it a little tight because I know you have a great historical like perspective on this whole thing but you were more of a film buff that's how you got into this right? absolutely right I was not an art designer I just happened to do a theater for myself as a as an experiment and it kind of became an industry so I was lucky and I latched into that vision to develop it over the years following the, the you know the change in technology right and and establishing taste levels for the clients. Uh, so it's been, a, we've come to this point where we literally try to do something more substantial in blending technology with design. Before we were kind of hand over 
what the room was to an integrator and we didn't take responsibility sometimes of how the theater sounded. Some integrators are very adept in doing mm -hmm. a good job, some others are not. So, because we didn't get involved in the electronics, we kind of let it to somebody else. Right now, we're taking a different approach. We believe that technology and design have to work hand in hand right. for a very holistic uh, approach and a final result that pleases the client both, both aesthetically and from uh, the technology perspective. As you're walking the floor at a show like this, you mm -hmm. must be very thrilled with what you're seeing as far as the technology, as far as where we're getting with display technology, but moreover, how to hide technology, and that's got to yeah. be gratifying, making yeah. your life easier. It's, it is, yeah. yeah. As the technology moves, it's, it's easier to, to sell to, to clients because they already know. They already know of this technology. That's great. Yeah. Every, everyone's um, keen to, to use the technology in their homes. That dovetails into my next question. You've got to, when the client insists that you've got to hide all this stuff yep. in a room, you're also dealing with an interior designer and an architect. And tell me about having those difficult conversations where you might be at loggerheads. It, it, exactly, so you know, from, from, from Cornflake's point of view, we just want it to sound and look the best. Right. Um, sure. It might, you know, depending on the space and depending on what the client wants, you know, if they want reference sound, well, the speakers are quite big. <laughs> right. And, and they have to be hidden. And, and if the interior designer objects to, to the speakers, but they don't want to build out the room to a certain depth, then we have difficult conversations of, okay, well, what can we do to create the same experience for the client, but sure. keep the interior designer and the architect happy? Um, so, yeah, they, they can have lengthy conversations and, and sometimes we have to compromise. Um, but at the end of the day, you need all parties to be happy. You need all parties to have decided their interaction in the project and you, you get a much happier ending if all parties are happy. Theo, care to weigh in? Absolutely. Without having a synergy between designers, architects, the client, the integrator, the product, project limps. Uh, yesterday I taught a class emphasizing the importance of us as integrators, although I'm not per se integrators, I was speaking from the integrator's right. perspective, of listening to the designer, training the designer about the limitations they have in trying to apply their designs, mm -hmm. and uh, making sure that they don't jeopardize the effect of the integrator, mm -hmm. but we also don't jeopardize the aesthetic effect of the, that the designer tries to achieve, right. because that's in the end, that's what resonates with the client. The client are more attracted to visuals. They can understand what they understand. They know about designs, technology. Yep. They want the best, but they don't know how to achieve it. So, yep. so you have to make sure that the two ends of the, of the project meet halfway. Gotcha. And it's compromises along the way, as long as the compromises do not jeopardize the overall integrity of the project. And, and if, there is, if there's a compromise that we, we understand that you're not going to achieve what you want as your brief uh -huh. if you compromise it this far. So we'll go back and we'll try and push back, but if we get a lot of resistance, then the compromise stays as it is. You know, you don't sure. rock the boat. It's, it's, the client's got to be happy at the end of the day. What are your most common challenges beyond that, dealing with that footprint in London in an urban area like that? Mm -hmm. I would say that you know, an average, an average um, price for a square metre in the areas that we operate or work, most of our projects is twenty thousand pound a square meter. So <laughs> if you're twenty thousand pound a square meter, so if you're telling a client to reduce their overall footprint of their room because of uh, acoustics, isolation, and speakers yeah, and isolation, right, yeah. then they they could have lost eighty to hundred thousand pound. Oh. So that is a tough challenge. Wow. But if you demonstrate this is a room that mm -hmm. is acoustically treated, like our cinema in a showroom, and then we'll show the client, well, this is a, a, a media space that isn't acoustically treated, which do you prefer? The, the, the sound, right. you know, listen to the sound of your voice. What do you like the sound of? Then it becomes slightly easier, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of pill to, to swallow when you... You had mentioned your showroom earlier. Now, how much space is in there? What, what, what kind of displays do you have in there? How are you demonstrating what you do to the client in that space? Uh, I'm unsure of the exact size of it, no but um, we, we, we have different areas and we showcase different ways of 
um, hiding technology, using technology. So Terrific. we have um, we have a, a, a lighting design uh, room mm -hmm. where we can show clients how we can light their cinemas or light their house. Um, we have a, a kitchen. We have different ways of concealing speakers, plastering, um, uh, f flush ceiling, on wall, in wall. We have t TVs, different mounting. We have um, art, digital art. Right. We have a cinema. Um, we ha we try and make every space interact as uh, it could be a different room in your house. You're walking to a different space. This is how you you could effectively put technology into mm -hmm. this room. So uh, we have one room which is a, a, a games room, which is more interactive. So we've got you know touch screens. We've got um, uh, more of a, a fun feel to it, which could be a subterranean sort of media space that's got table tennis tables and, and, and games rooms. So we try and um, we try and design the technology for the room, mm -hmm. so they're sure. walking through possibilities of their own house. So Theo, uh, what challenges do you usually encounter when you're talking about a more suburban build, not something so uh, urban? The suburban is not a question in the U.S. because there's usually a basement in the house. There you go. I, I only had to dig down once because the community where the theater was built did not allow the house to be more than two uh, levels. Huh. And the area with the cinema and the other entertainment spaces had to be three stories in itself. Okay. So I had to dig down. We were joking. We're reaching China if we <laughs> if we dig anymore. But uh, usually we don't have the problem. Uh, the problem that I have is uh, lately is people, as they become more familiar with casual viewing, media rooms is uh, uh -huh. something that they approach. Uh, they don't want to go into the basement to get the theater. I have this problem which I didn't have. To me. Putting a theater in an unused space with no windows makes sense because you don't want to have windows in the theater because right. it's like, but uh, but they are, they're ask, asking for theaters in, in a bedroom and then you have to come up with a solution to hide the windows uh -huh, because sure. you're not going to hang curtains to hide the windows. That's a very easy solution and that creates a problem. So persuading people of what of where they should put the theater down in the basement is a very new thing that's happening in the US before right. it was we have an unused basement let's put the theater there now it's let's put the theater where we actually live and interact but to me that separates media room from home theater from right. cinema media room is something where you can put in a space with windows and it doesn't have to be constrained within the perimeters of four right. wall right but theater is there. So this is, I, 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 we don't have any of the challenge that uh, you guys have in England, fortunately. Right. And when we're talking about a dedicated home, home theater, especially yes. in an urban environment, mm -hmm. we're talking about sound isolation that has to be as, as precise as possible, as excellent as possible, as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. And not only do you have to prevent, prevent sound from coming in, Boy, in central London, you got to prevent sound from going out. To, to a client, that's more important. Yes, so, if, 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 sure. We certainly see that the client do not want a loud theatre. Sure. To be um, to annoy the neighbours, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, uh, and annoy adjacent rooms because they're all pretty much on on, on top of each other. Of course, they don't, don't have the. Um, dedicated room that's completely separated from the rest of the house. So, so talk a little bit about your preferred methods of sound isolation. Mm -hmm. So we we uh, use the uh, CAT system. Okay. So it's a, it's a modular diffuser and um, uh, absorber system that we model the room and then we place exactly what diffusers and what absorption are required. So you right. know, if you've got um, bass or room nodes in certain locations, then we'll put you know, diffusers or bass traps. Um, and then the uh, diffusers will be f you know, more for the first reflections or ceilings, you know, first reflections are around each t speaker and where they're positioned. Right. Um, but we also try and put some um, absorbent or some, some hush underlay under carpet. If it's, it, it's usually concrete though. Uh -huh. So we, we, we're usually good there because they've already dug down yeah. subterranean. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's all it's all usually hidden and fabriced over. So we we uh, we use a, a partner that does very very um, unique fabric covering 
So most of our systems are hidden. So with the advent of, of these immersive sound systems now, Dolby Atmos and the like, and these other formats, I'd imagine that special care must be taken with the ceiling now too, huh? Yeah, and, 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 and the cost of acoustics and design yeah, escalates. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, when you're kind of achieving this, the next problem that you run into is you have a sealed room and you have to move air in yes. and out of that room yeah. or else it'll be dangerous, uncomfortable, right. and furthermore, the HVAC, we're talking about a system that can interfere with the sound experience there. Yeah. So talk about how you uh, overcome some of those issues for so reference quality. Luckily, when we, when we um, are, are part of a, a bigger project team, they always have m and &E consultants on board. Mm -hmm. So we will liaise with the M&E contractor and say, you know, what's the residual noise? What's the, the ambient noise of this HVAC? How do, we, how do we reduce the ambient noise within the space? And then we work out if it's going to affect uh, the acoustics. Um, sure. Um, and also projection as well. This, the, the same Should applies to deal. projection, even mm -hmm. more so. Yep. Yep. So talk about some of your preferred solutions. Uh, we start, when we deal with the isolation of the room, we start with the wall isolation, which is uh, a little different than, than how you treat the room to, to shape the sound inside the room. We, we have two or three methods of uh, room isolation that go from, from the simple to the very robust. Okay. Especially isolating the ceiling, hanging the ceiling, so there's no transmission of sound right. in the rooms above decoupling the studs of the wall from the drywall that's mm -hmm. in front of the wall. So make sure that no sound yeah. uh, slips out of the room. And then we bring in acoustical treatments like the cat tiles that, uh, you know, we mentioned that kind of shape the sound inside the room so that the reproduction uh, of the soundtrack is as precise and as possible. Okay, and HVAC? HVAC, we always work with the engineer of the house. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't see HVAC ducts in the room. Right. How okay. we're out the ducts and how we control the sound is a combination between our project architects and the HVAC guy. We maintain that we have to have a, set, a certain level of sound that their condition can produce that is tolerable. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't per se, we don't do the mechanical engineering, no. but we oversee what the engineer does from sound control and most and also from concealing ductwork. Mm -hmm. Usually the ducts go through the joist under the platforms and they vent from the risers. So working with the engineer is the answer. Gotcha. Are there any specific, uh, did you want to add? I was, I was just going to say the only, way, the only way we really can totally isolate a room is building a room within a room. It's right. the only way we, we, we ever Absolutely. achieve that, that, that bleed through to adjacent rooms. And it's building to you know to the ST ST60 standard to isolate the sound emission. Absolutely. Do you have any equipment that you really prefer when you're building reference grade cinemas? It depends. It, it depends on the on the cost of the total build. Sure. So we have a, a, a range of products that we've been using for um, well since the inception of, of Cornflake, mm -hmm. and it's all pretty much been studio based. So oh, really? very okay. uncolored. Very, very uncolored sound, so you know the likes of ATC, Bryston, mm -hmm. PMC, um, and our most recent uh, partnership, which is unique to Cornflake, is Maya Sound, which you probably mm -hmm. know Maya Sound Theo yes. very well. Yes. Um, it's used in 70% of Broadway shows. A, a plethora of of live performers and gigs use it. Um, we like an, an uncolored, dynamic, active sound. All right. Talk about how important calibrating these systems are. As I know this is something that was covered in the Home Cinema Masterclass that Theo and Anthony yep. Grimani and uh, Joel Silver uh, taught yesterday. Do you mean calibrating the end? The room sound? after you. The after room after you're done. The, the video, the, the audio. The equipment and the room and the video. Yeah, it's, it, it's it, it, you know, if, if, you, if you bought a quarter of a million pound Ferrari and, 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 and put spare wheels on it, yes, uh -huh. it, will, it will perform. But that calibration is the last five percent and, and it's it, is the it is the optimization of that room that you'll get that performance yes you can build it to correct standards you can you can design the speaker placement for the immersive sound but unless you calibrate both the, the projection and the audio at the end you've lost you've lost the essence of what you've tried to set out and achieve it is probably the most important finishing touch Absolutely. in the theater 
Uh, for me, there are two important finishing touches. Calibrating the room is important. Joel Silver comes and calibrates the projector. Yep. Uh, Steve Haas from SA's Acoustics, or other people come in and calibrate the sound. Some, some uh, uh, companies that do electronics, like CAT, bring their own engineers to right. calibrate. But uh, for me, when I see it from a design perspective, parallel to the calibration of the room is the calibration of the lighting. I believe mm -hmm. the lighting is the most important element okay. in, to, in to bring the room to life. Yep. So you can't just leave the room with down lights, mm -hmm at any uh, intensity they want. So you have to come in and sit down with the client and work out the, the various scenes and zones right. that mm -hmm. were built in the design. So what you see is something that is very pleasing to be in and can be locked, that calibration can be locked through the automation. So the client has always the same experience. Every time he gets to the room, the lights are for set for the entry level, the different settings for the movie level, mm -hmm. different settings for the end credits level. Mm -hmm. We bring the lights of the house up a little bit nice. so you don't wash out the screen. To me, it's, the whole experience has to be very theatrical. Yeah. It is not just come in and turn the lights off to watch a movie. Mm -hmm. It's how it operates. It has to have the smoothness of a West End show mm -hmm. in order for the clock to to extract that emotional response from the client. When you're all done, how do you have that conversation with the clients? Like, I look, I want to take pictures of this and enter this into a, uh, an awards competition. Or are you having that conversation out of the gate? Uh, no, it's, it's always after a handover and, and sh seeing, um, seeing the reception of what, <laughs> uh, of what we've built. And, sure. you know, and, and they've probably gone through the challenges because this is one room in many that they've had to endure okay. and go through for us. Um, we remember we do the whole house as well, so um, so we always have it after when they're nice and composed and relaxed. Um, most are receptive, actually. Oh, that's yeah. great. Most are receptive. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Your if, if you do a good job, they're receptive. That's terrific. Uh, they have to be. Rece if we don't make them receptive, you don't get the referral from the client, uh, right? Which right. is friends. But uh, a good theater is a good marketing tool because a lot of wealthy friends of the clan come in and if they like yeah. what they see, that's Absolutely. the most, the least expensive referral and marketing you know, element you can get for your job. Just a quick marketing note, we had Theo uh, and Joel Silver on, or excuse me, Anthony Grimani on a podcast here recently all about the cinema design masterclass that these gents taught on Monday. And it's, it's a pretty good listen. Cedia.net is the place to go if you want to find out more. You, the Cedia podcast on iTunes is where to find it. I don't have the f right file number with me, but it's easy to find in there. Uh, quick search. Does anybody have any questions before we wrap up? We only have a couple of minutes. I think there's a box here that actually you can use if you'd like. That is, I'm going to play talk show speaker? host. Here you go. Oh That's my God, I've never <laughs> seen a speaker in a box. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to throw it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, one question, you mentioned the difference between theater and uh, media, media room. room. Um, with the new LED direct view uh, technology, uh, especially the micro LED, uh, that difference could be minimized or overcome because of the better contrast and better uh, uh, out light output and better color output from these new displays. How do you see that? And are you using those or uh, are you planning on uh, using those? To me, the technology has nothing to do with the difference between media room and, uh, and a dedicated theater. You can get just as good a picture in a theater with a good projector as you get outside. It's not that you have a dedicated room because you can get bright enough pictures in the media room. You use the media room for more casual viewing, viewing uh, without being disturbed by the intrusion of light from the windows, from kids, from animals. And you use the theater when you have a more, and uh, you want to focus on the movie the same way you watch it in, in a movie theater without distractions, with absolute emphasis on the screen. So, but there's a new technologies that are coming out for LED screens in the theater. I'm very hesitant to embrace them because these big walls are very transparent and you can put speakers behind them. Mm. You have to speakers underneath or yeah. below. And I'm a big proponent of localization. If the sound doesn't come from where the mouths of the people are, mm. I feel distracted. Yeah. I feel like it's, hap it's happening elsewhere. So 
LED screens, as bright as they are, are not at this point uh, made for dedicated theaters. Yeah. Real quick, out of time. Yeah, of course, the proponents of those displays say they have a solution, and of course that's to see, uh, the, well, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so we'll have to wait yeah. and see. All right. Ladies and gents, uh, Peter Miller from Cornflake, Theo Calamaracas uh, with Reba. How about a round of applause for our guests, please? Thank you.